Thank you so much for coming out. You know, I'm just one uh, humble volunteer from the Washington Post, and this couldn't be possible without, without hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. Uh, so treat your yellow shirts, your blue shirts, uh, your lanyards kindly, because we're just, we want to help you guys have a great time. Uh, it is, and also, uh, so today it'll be my pleasure to introduce Jim Ottaviani. And I will, do need to say that uh, we need to thank Warren Bernard and Small Press Expo, who have uh, brought, made sure to bring him out. And so he could not be with us if not for them. And they are in mid-September here in North Bethesda. I recommend going if you're, if you're in the neighborhood. So Mr. Adiviani, I mean, I'd say uh, in terms of nuclear power plant workers who are so well known in comics and cartooning, number one would have to be Homer Simpson. And number two is Jim Ottaviani. And uh, he, uh, you know, he, he, it's amazing because he started down that road, nuclear engineering. So he has that kind of brain, but all of a sudden he got into, interested in library science and, and became a librarian and made this sharp pivot. And it is because of that that we have been so lucky that he has been able to create works like uh, Two Fisted Science, which one is Eric Grant. And for him to help put in comics form for us with his collaborators, such people as, as Galileo and, uh, and uh, in this year with Stephen Hawking, and I recommend it. And I'm told just now that next year he'll be adapting. The, before us, we had Professor Wilson, and, and Jim will be adapting in a comics form, a naturalist. So it's just he, he, he helps all of us, not just our, our, our children, but us kind of understand science in new ways. I particularly love Feynman. Uh, I highly recommend it, get it. But uh, let's get a chance, you know, all the way from Michigan and uh, in deep blue, the deep pink and gray brain of Jim Ottaviani. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I couldn't get into the Ruth Bader Ginsburg talk either. Uh, so I'm grateful that there was enough overflow to fill, to fill the room. Uh, but, but again, thank you very much for coming. And thanks to SPX and the National Book Festival for having me here. Um, it's traditional for authors to do readings at these events. So let's start there. I'm going to jump to one of my favorite pages of the book, which is page 52, and it begins panel one, inset, showing Hubble at the eyepiece of the 100-inch refractor telescope. Source, BBSS, colon, 277. Caption, borderless and floating. Edwin Hubble worked the night shift at Mount Wilson Observatory, watching the skies and making observations that might settle the great debate. Hubble, thinking, how big is the universe? caption, borderless and floating, or closer to home, is our galaxy, the Milky Way, the only one? Panel two, borderless and very large, showing the scale of the telescope with Hubble at it, as in it's very big and he's very small. Caption, borderless and floating. There were no space telescopes named after him to provide beautiful images of other galaxies or nebulae yet, so Hubble had to make careful observations from a telescope on a cold mountain in Southern California. Hubble, thinking, and how am I gonna get my eyelashes unfrozen from this eyepiece? <laughs> Labels with arrows, Edwin Hubble, 100 inch reflector telescope. Label in the upper right outside panel, the universe. Have you had enough? Um, so now you know why science comics writers maybe don't get invited to events like this <laughs> all that often. Uh, maybe it's just me, uh, and maybe it's because I'm a little bit too literal. Or maybe it's because reading from comics is kind of awkward. Uh, and it would be even if I put the images up on the screen. Since then you'd be reading along with me and my voiceover would intrude on your own interpretation of the scene and what you're reading and what you're seeing. Uh, you'd have the characters and the words in front of you and I'd just be in the way. Because that's one of the great things about words on a page, right? You hear a combination of the voice the author wants you to hear in, the own vo in your own voice, inside your head. And reading anything is a collaboration. 
uh, and reading comics is a particularly close one, I would say. Now, that for the first collaborators are, of course, the writer and the artist. So, in the interest of science, let's talk about that collaboration and the mechanics of reading comics and making comics by coming back to the page that I just read you. Here's what it looks like in script form. By the time it's turned into comics, here's what you, the reader, will see, at least in terms of prose. So leaving aside the research and the badly written stuff and the drafts and the polishes, even if I get something right the very first time, you're still only gonna see a tiny percentage of what I write. And that's cool, that's good, it's comics. You, if you wanted only words, you'd pick up a different kind of book. With comics, you're here for the words and the pictures. Uh, but what happens with all that descriptive text that you don't see? Well, most of it is in service of telling the artist which of the very comics-specific tools I think we should use to tell the story. Because comics does have an extremely large toolbox. I'd argue that it's as large or larger than prose or theater or movies. And though many of these things may be familiar to you, their use as storytelling tools may not be so familiar. So let me briefly introduce, or perhaps reintroduce, you to some of these tools in Hawking. We start with font. It's something, that is often it's something that's often invisible in prose novels or prose nonfiction, but it's something that we think a great deal about in comics for a couple of reasons. One, because it needs to work well with the art. And second, as you can see in that second panel, you can use it as a tool to indicate other things happening using a font and using kerning visually. And in this case, what you're seeing is what uh, his, his friends, when he was a young man, called hawking ease, speaking extremely fast uh, and extremely densely and just not stopping at all. Now, most of us were familiar with Hawking once the computer-generated voice kicked in. And so, again, in comics, we can indicate that visually by moving towards a little bit more of a mechanical font. We can use SFX, sound effects, that crunch there as the two skulls hit each other. We can use color. In between the time when Hawking was, was able to speak using his you know, own vocal cords and the mechanical voice, things started to fade for him. And so in comics, we have the opportunity, the ability to fade out that speech for you as well by graying things out. We can use words to get inside people's heads with thought balloons. These aren't words so much as equations, but you get the idea. And finally, we can mix things together. We have captions up in the, uh, in the upper left-hand corner of that panel. We have speech. We have two, two separate fonts interplaying. We can even throw labels on top of the images. And hey, when the going gets abstract, we can even skip the pictures, at least for a little while. Now, I do comics about science and scientists, and I rarely want or need to ditch the pictures because comics and science are, I would argue, a natural pairing. Think about this, if you will. You can even close your eyes if you want to. Imagine the best library or the best bookstore in the world. All the great works of literature on one side, and maybe even some of the not so great works of literature that you pick up before you're going to for a beach vacation and are just gonna read for fun. And on the other side is science. There's nothing else in this place, just literature and science. It is the best. <laughs> you're flipping through mentally those great works of literature, and you think about what you see. Now you turn to the other side of the aisle and flip through the comics. Where are all the pictures living? It's in the science side. It's how scientists communicate. It's almost impossible, according to most of the folks that I know, to even do science uh, without thinking, drawing, using images. Uh, one of Stephen Hawking's closest friends and collaborators, uh, a fellow named Malcolm Perry said, yeah, and whiteboards aren't even any good. It has to be chalk and a blackboard. 
I, I'm, I'm obviously not that hardcore because if I tried to do what I do with Blackboard and Chalk, nobody, but you know, it would be an addition of one and it wouldn't survive, definitely wouldn't survive beach reading. But anyway, comics and science are, I would argue, a natural pairing. So, the way we use pictures, sometimes we skip the words altogether. So you can see Hawking reacting in time. In, the, in this case, what you're seeing is him being very proud of putting forth a, an important, and it turns out right, theory, and it not uh, registering at all with his audience. We can use it as set dressing. And here we're, here we're back to that panel I showed you a little bit before. I don't expect people to read those equations or necessarily even understand them. They're accurate, because if they're not accurate, I will get letters. <laughs> but they're there as visuals to indicate science is happening over here. We use color, as in the color on that sound effects, and we also talk about uh, in the images where the pictures contradict the images. And here, of course, Hawking is talking about how excellent he was as a coxswain, as an undergraduate, and the image kind of tells you that he wasn't nearly as good as he thought he is. Uh, it can complement the pictures, happiness with doing good science. We can use color to indicate flashback, the classic sepia tone that you want to want to show uh, something happening long, long ago. And then finally, use exaggeration, sometimes extreme exaggeration, a pose that no one could actually achieve in real life. And this is the first time that Hawking's disease is manifesting itself uh, in a really important way as an undergrad. So those are the basic tools that we think about when we're making comics and when we're doing comics. Uh, the challenge, of course, is to use them well, uh, because as great as comics are, they do come with, with some built-in structural challenges also. Reading order and pacing are the biggest of these. In comics, you have to think of pages as important in and of themselves, because when a reader turns a page, and, even, and this is true even on digital devices, they can't help but see the whole spread of those two things that, you're, that you've drawn and presented all at once. So you have to care, in a way prose writers don't really have to care, about when a reader turns a page. And you have to think about how every single two-page spread is going to be read in the instant someone does that natural, automatic thing of moving the hand across. So you need to hide visual surprises behind the odd pages or you'll spoil the story, if only just a little, for the reader. What about the second thing? What about reading order? What is that? What you, why would we even think about that? And for authors in prose, they don't think about it, because in English, at least, we know what's gonna happen. Left to right, top to bottom, each line each new line appears right underneath its predecessor, and everybody knows where to look next. In comics, it's a bit more complicated. You don't get reading order for free. You have to engineer it, and you can confuse readers if you get it wrong. So let's go back to that nonsense that I started with, the script for page 52. Here again is what you're going to see in terms of text on the page. And it's clear. The reading order is clear. Now we get to a beautiful drawing by Leland, and that's clear as well. And then we put the lettering in, and now we got a problem. What order are we supposed to look at those blocks of text? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? None of these are terrific, in fact, because each violates that left to right, top to bottom, norm or principle in big or small ways. So what do you do? Well, when faced with an artist's beautiful drawing, here's my solution. I read the comics as comics. I don't allow myself to go back and look at the script unless something is going wrong. This was a case where something was going wrong. Uh, and you, even then, what I asked for 
typically doesn't matter. Uh, storytelling clarity is our priority. So in this case, rather than ask for a redraw, and if I did that, I might not be here because Leland would have killed me. Um, and rather than having to completely rewrite the page, I came up with this solution. And you'll see it's in very low resolution uh, because this is just a very, uh, crude uh, proof of concept. I didn't even flip the lettering. But what I did was take the first panel of the, of the page and mirror image it. Now I'm counting on the fact that nobody's gonna call, call me on Hubble using his left hand rather than his right hand now. And by combining a few captions, the reading order, uh, and I want the reading order to work. So you get to the finish page, and you do get that left to right, top to bottom thing that you want, and Leland doesn't kill me, and I get to come to the National Book Festival. <laughs> so that's comics. Um, and now to reveal the only other secret of creating science comics that you'll need to do this yourself at home. Uh, the one I've been asked regularly about for over 20 years. And one I can finally answer. So here's where. I'm a volunteer at 826 Michigan, which is a chapter of the nationwide group of nonprofit writing and tutoring centers founded by Dave Eggers. And a fellow, colleague, a fellow tutor of mine named Lois, uh, this was in the early 2010s, told me that I should go to Stephen Hawking's 70th birthday party. And I'm here to tell you that when a good idea like that comes across, you don't hesitate, you just say yes, right? Except I did, uh, because there was this Midwestern thing in me that made me kinda sorta want a formal invitation. Uh, and even though Lois is a good friend of Hawking, I'm not sure the transitive property works that quite that, or is it the commutative property? Uh, don't don't uh, ever quote me on math, at least on the fly. I'm not sure it works that way. Anyway, so we fast forward about a year, during which Lois and I continue to help students with their homework, and in between times we talk, uh, and during which I become convinced that Stephen Hawking's life story would in fact be great for a graphic novel. In truth, I was pretty sure that that was right from the start, uh, but there was someone else whose opinion mattered. Um, he didn't actually say no, but he didn't say yes either because I didn't have the guts to ask. So after lots more talk and lots more tutoring still, summer arrived and with it, the end of our weekly meetups at Liberty Street Robot Supply and Repair, uh, the A26 quarter, headquarters, uh, but I kept thinking and Lois apparently did too. In fact, she did more than that because not long after summer break started, I saw this. That's the subject line of an email I received on July 4th, 2012. No capitalization, no punctuation, no elaboration. It came from Lois. And in it, she let me know that the world would soon find out, because this is early in the day, that her husband Gordy had won his 100 bucks back from Hawking because their colleagues at CERN had shown that the Higgs boson was a real thing. And oh, by the way, Stephen, he liked that book of yours. And he thinks you ought to come over and talk to him about doing a book, graphic novel about him. So, you know, <laughs> I would have maybe capitalized Big Day. <laughs> um, and since then, I don't think there's been a single day big or small, that Leland and I haven't thought about this book, worked on this book, looked forward to doing this book, and wanting for you to have a book like this in your hand. So there's your answer on how you get your ideas. Unfortunately, just like so many solutions to ridiculously hard physics problems, like what does the event horizon look like for a spinning, electrically charged black hole, it's of limited use in the real world because you don't know Lois, you're not gonna do a graphic novel about Hawking, it's just not gonna work in every situation. Uh, but it worked for us, and here's what happened next. And that's why you have a black screen there. Uh, we bought plane tickets, we delayed, reason, delayed going for reasons of his health, we delayed going for reasons of me being afraid, I definitely wasn't, was worried about making a good impression and not wasting anybody's time. Uh, and we finally got on a plane to England and we arrived and never saw Hawking the whole time. 
which is not the punchline you or I expected. But what did happen was still kind of wonderful since we had something of a gay to lease experience. Oh, there was one more big day there, wasn't there? The auto, auto advance isn't working on these slides, so uh, I kind of ruined, ruined another punchline. But anyway, we had a gay to lease experience, uh, and this, this piece about Frank Sinatra is from Esquire magazine, and it's famous for being one of the best celebrity profiles ever. And it really is excellent and just as famous for the fact that Talese never talked to Sinatra, which was unheard of in journalism at the time. Now, Leela and I weren't and still aren't journalists, uh, but our Feynman and Hawking books are, I would th say, firmly in the genre Talese was famous for, which is narrative nonfiction. Uh, and our experience was very Sinatra has a cold, if you will, because when we got there, Professor Hawking was not feeling well again. And you know, he endured poor health constantly, but this was a little bit more than normal. So we did, never did actually get to meet him. But thanks to our friends Lois and Gordy, and mutual friends and colleagues of Hawking's, uh, Malcolm, who I already mentioned, and Anya in Cambridge, uh, though that particular door was closed, so many more were actually open. Because without Hawking available and setting the schedule for everyone around him, we kind of went everywhere, we saw everything and talked to everyone, again, except for him. We spent hours and hours in his world, uh, from Cambridge at large, to his department in specific, to his office, and yes, to his bedroom, to uh, tease a little bit more of the title, of the title slide. But mostly we spent time in a closet, uh, because Yvonne, I'm seeing a closet. Oh, I get what's happening. I see something before you see it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> What's it like to time travel? <laughs> we spent a lot of time in a closet uh, because a librarian there gave us unlimited access to raw materials in its rawest form, an archive that hadn't been processed by archivists. Now, as Michael said, uh, I'm a librarian by day, so this felt particularly subversive. Uh, and it was also thrilling and frustrating in turns uh, because it was full of treasures in no particular order at all. So many things to discover, including this. Uh, because there were things there that I would love to have in my house. Uh, but I didn't just, we didn't just see that. We saw a ton of really interesting stuff. We saw papers and slides that made it into presentations done in his own hand. There was an Order of the British Empire medal. Always wanted one of those. Uh, there were letters from his youth into his uh, adulthood, from him to other and including very famous people. There were photos and photos uh, from secret agent stuff to more sardonic looking stuff, to a first edition of the Brief History of Time autographed in the way that only he could and would do by the time that book came out. And early drafts of, of his work, I got to read like three different versions of A Brief History of Time, captured image by image on a really clunky old iPad, taking up most of the storage space uh, on it and a bunch of SD memory cards afterwards. We spent days working through this stuff, and we didn't steal anything. We also spent time in, in his working environment, though, as, as I mentioned, and that meant uh, the environment of people and the physical spaces so that we could enrich the book visually and emotionally. So there we were at the Center for Theoretical Physi Physics, Uh, with, with a blackboard that appears in the comic right over to his office where we took lots and lots of video. Uh, he was, in fact, a Feynman fan. I like to think that he had our graphic novel with him in the hospital. Probably not true. Uh, but we saw lots of photos of Richard Feynman and also Marilyn Monroe. Um, and the machinery and the people and the things that kept him productive and in touch with the rest of us and the rest of the world, scientific and otherwise, throughout most of his career. And no, we didn't actually sit in the wheelchair. 
But yes, we did finally get to the home and to fill the, fulfill the promise of the title, we did end up in his bedroom. Because when his personal assistant asks if you're done now and if you'd like to go to Hawking's house, you actually don't hesitate this time. You say yes. And so that's where we went. This is that, the aforementioned personal assistant, Judith, uh, with my wife, Kat, a photo that I could never show while he was alive because it shows his house door number. Um, one of my favorite things ever. Uh, and it was in his home, in fact, where we happened into one of the most revealing and helpful conversations that we could have. It was late in the evening, uh, 5.50 p.m. to be precise, according to the digital clock in his bathroom. Trust me, we have a photo of that, but it's Hawking's bathroom, and I'm not gonna show you a photo of that. that my, again, my Midwestern Reserve won't let us go there even posthumously. But anyway, Judith, his assistant, showed us around, we took photos, we asked questions, and just sort of freaked out about having been invited over. Uh, and then as things kind of wound down, as the rain started to spatter into the skylight above the stairs, it was early spring in Cambridge, so of course it was raining, uh, something somebody sa said sparked Judith's memory of, I, I don't even remember what. Uh, the specifics don't really matter, uh, and she was clearly speaking off the record, even though we weren't recording in the first place. Uh, and I, in fact, thought about pulling out a recorder and doing so right then, but realized in the same instant that if I pulled out that iPad, it would kind of ruin the moment. And even if I had a, I'd had a smartphone at the time, uh, it would have ruined the moment, but an iPad? Yeah. So we listened and we talked and we laughed and we got kind of serious about some stuff and thoughtful and we listened some more. And then we parted ways for the day. And Kat, my wife, and Leland, the artist, and I looked at each other when we left the house in silent agreement and said nothing to each other as we rushed back to our dorm room and then immediately started writing down everything she'd said that we could remember from the conversation and filling in the blanks for each other. And it's not that anything specific came from that conversation in the hallway, in the rain, that made it into the book. But I think it's in every scene of the book anyway. Uh, not, per not perhaps every scene, but here is the view from the bed, and here's how it ends up in comics. Uh, and, it, and, and that conversation didn't even ref, didn't touch on the scientific work at all, uh, which is there, complete with equations, as we just saw, because it has to be. Uh, because for all his celebrity and media appearances, uh, Hawking is not buried in Westminster near Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin uh, for his guest starring role on The Simpsons or even his popular science books. It's the work. So our talk in the stairwell, in the rain, isn't so much in the stuff with equations in it. Uh, but I'd say it's everywhere else. And a few days later, uh, we were still in England. We, we made it into a little bit of a vacation as well. Uh, while visiting Down House, which is Darwin's home, and while walking along his famous sand walk, my wife, Kat, noticed I'd fallen silent again and was writing in my notebook and she knew that, what that meant. So she and her friend Mags walked ahead and I wrote the bones of the ending of the book there among Darwin's trees and in the rain. It was England, spring. Uh, so despite not going to Hawking's birthday party, we did end up spending an unusually large amount of time with people and in places that meant something to him, including his house and his bedroom, a place where we Midwesterners never go. Uh, unless it's a party in the winter, right? And you're told to toss your coat on the pile in there, which you do, but then you flee with your eyes averted from everything else. So we didn't throw our coats on the bed, and we certainly didn't lie down in his bed. But yeah, we kind of did lean over to take photos of what a genius saw before his glasses came off, and he dreamed the thing things that geniuses dream of. Thank you.
And the timekeeper says we have a few minutes for questions, if people have questions. Hi, I can't see you because you're right in front of a light. But now I can see you. <laughs> Hi, thank you. A scientist presumably wouldn't go to the book to understand the, his science. Could you have done the book, or did you think about doing the book, without the equations which most of the readers would um, go past, slide past? Yeah. Uh, no. I don't think you can. I don't think you, well, should. Who am I to say what people should do, right? Uh, but I don't think you can. I certainly didn't want to. Uh, throughout all the books that I've ever done, I've tried to give people at least a feel for what it's like to be doing this stuff, to be doing this kind of work. And that means equations. Feynman was maybe a little bit easier because uh, what he's very famous for is quite diagrammatic, and it works even more seamlessly with comics. Although I would suggest that comics, again, comics and science work together very well. You've got sort of this cartoony representation of people, and you move over to diagrams, you move over to equations. It, it's not jarring on the eye at all. But, to, but again, to your question, I think it's only fair uh, to not focus merely on celebrity and best-selling authorness and saying provocative things about whether we should or should not uh, expose our presence to uh, potentially malevolent uh, alien beings. Yeah. Um, all those things are there, yeah. but it's the science that really made, made the difference in the world, I would think. That's what's gonna last longer than anything else. And we love books because they last too, so that seems, it seems appropriate yeah, got it. And in, in layman's terms, the science is there in terms of what its significance is, and I'll, I'll sit down. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, I hope so. Uh, my, Michael and I were just talking about this just before, uh, just as uh, the program was starting, and the question was, so what do you do to try to make it accessible to non-experts? And of course, the first thing that has to happen is it has to be accessible to me. I have to be able to figure it out and think that I can explain it reasonably well. Then I have the second pass of my editor who will say, hey, this just is not making sense in script form. And you know, these editors are particularly adept at you know, translating that garbage that I read, read straight from the script at the beginning into visuals in their head on the fly. So if it's not making sense to them, uh, then I know I haven't done a very good job. And then we get the third pass of the artist who's gonna create the visuals that go along this. And by the time all those things have happened, I think you have a pretty good shot of, of, like I said, at least giving the flavor of what it's like. It may not be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but this is not a court of law. It's a comic book, so it works out okay. There's someone on the side, yeah. Thank you very much, excellent speech. Thank you. Um, having spent time trying to get into the head of Feynman, <laughs> who you did have a chance to talk with, I did not know he he was he had died in 1988 and the the book didn't come out until 2011. Yeah, I'm an author with the same problem. My <laughs> my character uh, passed 20 years, well, 17 years before I wrote his biography. Yeah, could you compare and contrast in your head Feynman and Hawkins for us? Oh my, what a good question. Ah. <laughs> uh. There are a lot of comparisons, I would say. Fiercely, uh, this is recorded, right? <laughs> I'm gonna say it anyway, almost pathologically independent thinking. Um, so that's on the scientific side. On the personal side, they, they both, uh, they both had uh, sometimes complicated relationships with family and uh, loved ones, uh, but in the end inspired tremendous loyalty and showed tremendous loyalty to all. Um, and both of them, I think this is the ultimate reason why 
I was attracted to them in the first place. Both of them really, truly cared. And this is probably why I also got permission from you know, Hawking's, excuse me, Feynman's kids and Hawking himself to do this. Really, truly cared about spreading the big ideas out into the world and sharing the joy and wonder of having those big ideas out there. It's like, it's amazing universe. You should know this. And both of those people really wanted everybody to know this and see this. Um, I'd have to think a lot harder to go into detail and give you a more complete answer, but those are three. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, my question was, it seemed like your purpose in going to England was really to establish like the human element of his personality and understand like his yes. general, you know, social interactions and things like that. What Got in the, one, yep. What was the most remarkable thing that you found out about him through that experience that you don't think you would have been able to discover had you not gone? I knew a little bit about this thing beforehand because there is a really interesting book by, oh, I can't remember the author's name. I wanna say her name is Helene Melo. It's a French name and I'm awful at pronouncing French names. And I'm also probably not even remembering it accurately. But she wrote a book called Hawking Inc. Talking about, and you saw some pictures of, of the Hawking Inc stuff in this presentation. The machinery and the infrastructure built around keeping that amazing brain going, engaged, and present in the world. Uh, I don't think it hit, I, I had read uh, that other book that I mentioned before, but it didn't hit me in the gut until I was there, and until I was talking to you know friends and colleagues and seeing everything live. Uh, it was just remarkable and heartening. Uh, it really made me want national health care, uh, even more than I thought I did before, and I thought I did pretty much before too. Uh, gosh, that, that's probably the other thing. But just the emotional, and leaving aside that bit, I think it was just the emotional connection that all the people he knew, uh, including colleagues, you know, people can be coworkers and not know anything about each other, uh, and not even necessarily care a lot about each other. Uh, if you'll allow me a, a digression, uh, I went to a concert earlier this year. It was The Who. They're old. Uh, I'm not young, but they're older. And I was listening to an interview, and it turns out they're, they're like not great friends, Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey, but they describe themselves as really, really good co-workers, which is true. I think there was more than that with the people surrounding Hawking and vice versa is, is the sense that I got. And that's something that is hard to, cap, hard to capture or you know, learn about without having some of those person-to-person -person interactions. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, yeah, you're welcome. Is anybody on this? There's more on that side. Hi. Um, for the other book you wrote, Primates, Yes. Um, what made you decide to write about those three scientists? And were there any other scientists you considered putting in that book? Hang on. I want to show something, but I can't advance this slide anymore. So while, while the slide might, may or may not be advancing, uh, those three scientists, oop, that's going backwards, rats. I usually hide this slide, waiting possibly for, for this type of question. So about Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and Brute Galdikas. I had done a book, a, a, excuse me, a story about Dr. Brute in an earlier book called Dignifying Science. It was all about women, all women scientists. Uh, she's the orangutan researcher, as you know, from primates. Uh, and, what, and I had known almost nothing about her before starting. And then I realized, as far as Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey were concerned, I knew who they were, and I kind of thought I knew what they'd done, but really I mostly knew that they were famous for being famous and important, and didn't know any of the real science that they'd done, and didn't know any of the details 
So I was, just before coming here, I, I cheated. I did go to another author's presentation just before. It was a fellow named Brian Floca, who does a book called, did a book called Moonshot. And he, he succinctly described this. Writers are often told to write what you know, but the way Brian says it is, write what you want to know. And I wanted to know more about Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey. And I already knew a little bit about Dr. Brute. I'd had some interactions with her. We'd done some things together. And I thought, this is the, this is the next thing that I have to do uh, because these are really important people. And there are probably people like me out there who've kind of heard of Jane Goodall and yeah, chimpanzees and environmental work and she's really nice, but there's more. So I got the opportunity to do more. And now, other scientists that want to do things, Astronauts is coming out next year. It's also by the same artist, Maris Wicks, and we're doing, a, this is a book about uh, women astronauts, uh, including one whose name you may not know. Her name is Mary Cleves. She's the main character. I, I was hanging out with her a couple days ago. I got here early so I could uh, spend some time, some more time with Mary. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more to women astronauts than Sally Ride and Valentina Tereshkova. You probably knew that already, but it's true and it's been super fun. And I'm also doing a book about E.O. Wilson, uh, like Michael mentioned. And so th those are the covers of the two things coming up. Thanks. Sorry to say I didn't know who you were until I sat down and I loved your presentation. I'm excited about learning more about you. That's really nice, thank you. Um, and who is your target audience since I've never read anything by you? Uh, you. Good. So thanks for coming. <laughs> Good. Um, it, it actually varies. So primates, like, like the young woman uh, just said, uh, mentioned that was aimed at a you know 10 to 12 year old 10 to 14 I don't know uh, the book publishers have you know pretty good pretty good boxes and demarcations for things uh, but even when I'm writing for a younger readership I want them to bring their a game so try not to to write down it so that there's something there for people like you and me uh, as well but it's mostly, so Hawking is probably not gonna be as interesting to a really young reader, not because there's stuff in that that parents wouldn't want them to see necessarily, but it's a little bit further down the road in terms of abstraction and what they're doing. Now, if they're a Simpsons fan and they saw him on The Simpsons or on The Big Bang Theory, then maybe they'll pick it up anyway, and that's great. Um, but I guess in general, it's people who are a little bit curious about science, but saw the huge and wonderful James Glick biography of Feynman called Genius, but it's this thick and it's all words and that's way intimidating and I'm not gonna pick that up. Oh look, there's a comic book over here. And if it's, and with comics, it's actually, and this, this may just be me, but it's actually kind of hard to stop reading once you start, because you got a picture and then there's another related picture right next to it. So how can you not look at that? And it's got words and I can read, so I might as well read the words in that, and then there's more. Uh, it's a very welcoming medium. So I'm hoping that it's everybody. But yeah, there, there, are, there, there are lanes that some, some of the books fall into uh, that are easier to define than others. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, I too didn't know who you were before coming in here, but I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. I don't know who Definitely any of you are, really. I can't even <laughs> really see you. It's all good. Um, my question was, with comics, it's how do you get in touch with or choose an artist to work with? Mm. It's so central to the medium and getting that story across. You have this text that you write. Who, how do you figure out who yeah. to work with in terms of artistry and how that comes across on the page? Yeah, thanks. That's a, good, that's a really good question. I've been doing this for a while. Uh, since the mid to late 1990s. So I know a lot of artists. I go to comic book sh conventions. Uh, now that I'm no longer self-publishing books, when I started, nobody wanted this kind of junk. It's like, comics about science? Sure, I, you know, and I actually got a lot of interest from publishers, but it was all uh, of the form of, I really look forward to reading that when somebody else publishes it. 
um, and now somebody else is publishing it. Uh, so I know a lot of people, my editors have networks, but really what it comes down to uh, is I'm either writing for a specific artist, and I will say that Astronauts, uh, Maris was working on a couple books of her own, I wanted her to do this one, and the timing worked out just perfectly. Uh, Maris, if you're out there watching this, uh, she basically said, I am so sick of writing scripts for myself. I just want to draw something that I think will be good and not have to write and not have to do the research, not have to do the dialogue. It's like, hey, I got something for you. Um, and so that worked out. So it, as I'm writing the script, maybe not in the first pass, but definitely in the second pass, it's starting to have a look in, in my mind's eye, I kind of know what it ought to be looking like. And then I just sort of run through my mental list of like, eh, that's, that's a whole lot like Miris Wicks there. So I'll ask her and see what happens. And then, you know, a little bit of back and forth. It's not just my, it's not just, uh, my decision, it's the publisher's decision as well. I like to think I have veto power if they suggested something that really wouldn't work but it's never even come to that. We've always been able to agree very quickly on this. So know a lot of people, see a lot of comics, and you'll no doubt find somebody that is right for the type of story that you're doing in the moment, because there are a lot of terrific artists out there. The sign says wrap it up. So we are wrapped. Thank you.